The idea of urine was pioneered by a Chinese man by the name of Phoenix Fu with the goal of creating a domestic brand that could rival international standards of excellence. They succeeded. Urine has a ready to wear line priced at $480 for shoes and $499 for boots. Their ready to wear line features a small but focused variety of styles including Balmorals, hole cuts, and loafers. Yearn additionally partners with Arterton, a London-based design atelier from which you can purchase in-store or online. I myself bought from Arterton, and a little bit later in this video, I'm gonna talk a bit about the service experience I had with them. Now let's take a look at these shoes. Okay, so right away, lovely, rich, hunter green color on the box, gold embossing of the logo. The box has a sort of subtle leather texture to it, which I quite like. You have this tweed sheathing material here with a leather patch stitched on with the logo embossed. I quite like this choice of tweed as a material for the sheathing and the shoe bags. I think it's a nice sort of tasteful nod to traditional Western European textiles and the history of menswear. The right shoe and then the left shoe. They're both in great condition. There's no marring of any kind due to transportation. I could talk for a long time about all of the small details that go into this sort of shoe. I don't want this video to be that long. What I'm gonna do instead is split the difference and just do a sort of detailed overview. And then I'm going to compare this with another shoe to give you an idea of just what makes this shoe special. So right away, this is a burgundy Balmoral Oxford. Here you have the toe cap. It has a black patina on the front that adds a little bit more sophistication to the color as well as being able to help bring out a mirror shine from that darker color. It comes up to the quarter broguing here, the vamp, which again wraps around, parallel dual stitching going along the vamp. You have a closed lacing system, which means the vamp is stitched over the facing and the facing wraps around to the quarters of the shoe back to the heel where you have the back stay, which is a strip of leather that hides the stitching of the heel, as well as providing a little more support, design, and structure. Back on the front, you have flat waxed laces. I quite like flat wax laces. Again, they're a little more contemporary than round laces. I think that flat laces, the way they sit and hug the shoe really helps accentuate the last, which is the model of the shoe, the actual geometry, which really is the highlight of the whole design. On the inside of the shoe, you have a leather lining embossed with the urine logo. Moving down the side of the shoe, you have the welt, which has a 270 degree stitch. That means it begins right where the heel begins, wraps around the shoe, and then ends right where the heel begins again. This allows for the heel block to be a bit tighter to the upper of the shoe, which again adds to that elegant, sleek, contemporary design. The welt also features this lovely welt fudging here. It has a really great depth to it. Not all shoes have welt fudging and not all shoes that even do have welt fudging have it really well. Sometimes when it's quite shallow, it can feel almost drawn on, but you can actually tell just how deep those imprints are. The welt aesthetically functions to highlight the image of the upper, which is really what everything the shoe is about. It's about the design of the upper. So you don't want anything to take that away. The welt fudging just adds a little bit of accent to that outline. The welt is a strip of leather that is attached to the outsole. So there's actually two strips of leather here. It's sanded perfectly flush to one another and dyed very uniform. You can hardly even notice the difference. Moving now to the outsole of the shoe, you can see beautifully burnished and dyed, a really lovely, rich walnut brown. It has closed channel stitching and then features very nicely pinned brass tacks on the toe and the heel. So the reason closed channel stitching is done is first of all, it just results in a far more elegant look on the bottom of the shoe, which you might think no one sees, but people do see when you sit cross-legged, you know, people do peer and they do just barely make that out. People who know things about shoes and love shoes will notice and they will understand that this is someone who really appreciates the craft of shoemaking. Now the way closed channel stitching is done is they actually 
take the outsole leather and they cut halfway into it and flip up a small flap. They then stitch the outsole to the welt and then glue that flap back down. Now in time, that flap can pop back up. Typically, it happens at the toe, which is why these brass tacks are here because they help prevent that splitting from happening. Additionally, these brass tacks assist in reducing the wear of the shoe, increasing the longevity. That is strictly the purpose for the brass tacks on the heel. This has a two and a half inch waist, very nice slim waist adding to that elegant profile. It actually, something you can see, it has this really lovely soft bevel to it. A bevel on the waist of a shoe is typically a sign of quality and craftsmanship. It's usually something you see in a bespoke shoe. This isn't as strong as a bevel, what you would consider fiddleback. However, just the fact that there's a soft bevel at all, I think is an incredible accomplishment. Moving on to the heel, you have a combination heel, half rubber, half leather. This exists just to provide a little more traction if you have a fully burnished only leather sole and heel can get almost dangerously slippery on just about any surface, quite frankly. So it's nice to have just a little layer of rubber to help with the grip. The heel block itself has a very nice slight taper to it. Just another sign of quality craftsmanship, contributing that very sleek, elegant, contemporary profile that makes the shoe look sharp light and sophisticated. Now that we've talked about the whole shoe, I want to talk a bit about some of the special details that this shoe has that really make it stand out from the crowd of that sort of under $500 price range. The first is this stitching here. This is a decorative stitching. This is referred to as a swan's neck stitch. It's a tradition that originated in the 1930s in shoemaking. And again, I think it's really tasteful, much like the tweed, to have a nod to historical traditional shoemaking in a contemporary style shoe. It's a very lovely stitch that really highlights and reflects the overall curvature of the shoe. Now something else I'll note is the stitch density is exceptionally high on this shoe. There are two different stitch densities we look at. One is the stitch density for the upper and the second is the stitch density on the welt. Typically a shoe under $500, you'd expect stitch density of the upper maybe around eight to 10 stitches for the welt, maybe four to five stitches per inch. This has a really incredible 14 stitches per inch on the upper, which is measured by that parallel stitching on the vamp. And then on the welt, it has an extremely tight eight stitches per inch, which typically you wouldn't see that until you get into the $800, $900 price range for shoes. Additionally, this shoe is hand welted, hand sold, and hand lasted, and I wanna talk about all three of those right now. So there are really three different pieces in the construction. The upper, which is this leather, which is wrapped around and tucked underneath. The welt itself, which is a small, thin strip of leather, connects to the outsole here and stretches around the outside of the shoe. And then you have the outsole itself, which is a pad of leather that sticks onto the bottom of the shoe. And the way they're attached is with two primary stitches, the welt stitch and the sole stitch. You have the upper, the welt, and then the sole. You have the upper and the welt are stitched together, and then the welt and the sole are stitched together. So the welt stitch is the stitch that holds the welt and the upper together. You can't see that anywhere on the shoe. That is underneath on the inside of where that crease meets. That stitch is done by hand, but I think more compelling is the outsole stitch, which is what we see right here on the welt. And that's also the stitch that's hidden by the closed channel. The density of it, the tightness to the upper, if you asked someone how that was done, you would expect them to say it was done by a factory. I mean, it's almost unbelievable to think someone did that by hand. So I think that's just such a special detail about this shoe. You know, it might not make a difference for people looking at it, whether it's factory made or hand stitched, but again, these kind of details, you're not buying a shoe like this just because it looks nice. You know, you're buying it because you really have an appreciation for high levels of craftsmanship. The fact that someone touched this and sewed it by hand, it really gives you a connection with the maker, which I think is very, very special. So the last component of this shoe being handmade is that it's hand lasted. And so what that means is that when you last a shoe, the last of the shoe is a wooden model of the actual, it's the actual geometry of the shoe. The upper, which is this leather here, is stretched over that last to give it that shape. Now in a factory setting, lasting is done by machine. So you have your model, your last, and then your piece of leather and a machine, a die almost basically just 
compresses it down over the upper. When it's hand lasted, a shoemaker, him or herself, actually pulls the leather by hand and nails it to the last, effectively shaping the shoe by hand. With a hand lasted shoe, you can get a lot more complexity in the design and the geometry. A factory die can only get so complicated. So when you look at a shoe like this, and this will be more highlighted when we do the comparison, you can see just how tightly it tucks in around the edge of the welt, especially on the heel block where you get this very nice curvature just from the subtle last bit here. That can be done because the shoe is hand lasted. And again, on top of everything, it's just another one of these handmade touches. So now we've done a detailed overview of the shoe. Let's compare it to another shoe that will really, I think, highlight the details of this and just why some of these details are special. So I've got here the trusted legacy American brand, Allen Edmonds. This is their Park Avenue shoe. You can see I have had this, this has been worn. I do need to reshine it, it's cracking a little bit. I haven't worn this much though. I've only worn it maybe five or six times. You can actually see on the sole, the finishing on the sole has not even been worn at the toe, just to give you an idea of how few times I've actually worn this. So I wanna compare a few of the different details here. You know, the first thing is stitch density. Right, because stitch density doesn't seem like it'd be a big deal. Is it four stitches per inch? Is it eight? Like, why does that really matter? Parallel stitching or triple stitching? Why does it matter? This will really give you an idea. So you can see here, on the Allen Edmonds, it has for the vamp stitch, a triple stitch. And the spacing is a bit wider than on the yearn. It has a stitch density of only 10 stitches per inch versus 14. And you can see very quickly just how heavier it looks. Right, and you can see because it's not so uniform, just looks a little sloppy and it gives the shoe an overall kind of weight and clunkiness to it as opposed to the refined elegance of the Balmoral by Yearn. At the welt here, you can see the Allen Edmonds does not have welt fudging, it's just a flat welt. And then additionally, it has four stitches per inch as opposed to eight which you can really see how that changes the overall look of the shoe, even though it's such a small detail. Furthermore, what I wanna point out is just how far the stitches are from the upper. They come out a bit from the upper. Again, that's because it's done by factory, so they don't have the ability to have that precision that you can have by an artisan's hand. And what that means, I wanna show you something very interesting, is when you look at the shoes from the top down, you can actually see the welt stitching on the Allen Edmonds, and it distracts from the overall aesthetic, and you can see how on the urine shoe, it's a clean line with just that accent from the welt fudging, but on the Allen Edmonds shoe, it has this clunky looking stitching on it that really distracts from the overall geometry. Changing up to the soles, again, the Allen Edmonds is worn a little bit so we can look past that. You can really see the difference that that closed channel stitching makes. So the Allen Edmonds, despite being worn only four or five times now, the stitching is starting to fray here. So it's just not protected. It's a very practical thing to have closed channel stitching as well. And then it just doesn't look as great. It really takes away from the shoe. You have a full rubber heel block. So again, the Allen Edmonds, great. You'll get a little bit more grip, but this half leather really, again, is a sign of craftsmanship. It's a sign of quality. It's a sign of a shoe that's really exceptionally made with a lot of attention to detail and love put into it. Now, last thing I wanna talk about is the last of the shoe. So the actual design, the model of the shoe. You look at the Allen Edmonds, it's this very simple sort of half oval shape all throughout. Pretty big, it has a lot of space in it. The Yearn shoe, has a far more complicated geometry. So it's this very nice asymmetrical swoops down on the instep and has this very nice swoop on the exterior side and a curve in on the interior side. As well as the heel has a far more sort of bulbous curvature to it. One other interesting note, just how it wraps down tightly underneath to form that curve where the upper meets the welt on the Allen Edmonds basically comes down flat, so you really lose some of that interesting geometry, again, because this is factory lasted, where this is hand lasted. Now, I think a lot of people would look at this shoe and they'd say, Chris, that looks so incredibly un uncomfortable. How could I wear that? The Allen Edmonds has far more space. When you really look at your foot, it's not shaped like this. It's shaped like this. It comes, to, it swoops down on your instep. It is asymmetrical. So a shoe like this is really fitted to your foot. And you might think, well, the Allen Edmonds has more space, so it's more comfortable. And I think the best way to think about that is think about a suit. 
Like, what is the most comfortable sort of suit? Is it a baggy suit? Like, no, it's a suit that is tailored to you. And while it's not form fitting, it sort of hugs your body. And I think a shoe is very similar in when we talk about comfort. Now, on top of that, this has so much more leather that has to move and bend around. So you get not just creasing, but these rumples in the leather that really, uh, you know, just don't look that great. The urine shoe will suffer a lot less than that because there's a lot less leather that needs to be bent in order to accommodate that movement because again, it's shaped for your foot. So now that I've spoken about the highlights of the shoe, I wanna talk a little bit about imperfections with the product. So the first thing I'll note is the packaging. The box is a little more beat up than I expected it to be. It had a torn corner on the edge of the lid. It was sort of dusty all over. The exterior also had some marring. The sticker was kind of peeling off a little bit. For me, that first impression is really important. That packaging is really important. So I was just surprised at how much detail has gone into the shoe and yet the packaging is just a bit beat up. Another issue I've noticed is that the box when opening it had this very strong chemical smell to it. I imagine it's probably just the off-gassing of the adhesives used in the construction of the shoe. Very normal, however, it just wasn't really pleasant. It kind of hung around for a week and now they just smell like leather, but just not the most pleasant first impression. Then there were just some small defects. There's this scuff on the toe. There is a small sort of pimple, just a raised button in the leather. The heel block, the welt, has just a small sort of rough patch. And then the collar, you can see from the top down, there's this sort of wrinkle here in the leather. And you can actually see as well how the leather has a lot of creasing just from that wrinkle. I've tried to adjust it, but it doesn't seem to be able to change. I think it's just a quality of the actual piece of leather used for this quarter. The right shoe has some similar small defects. And that's it as far as problems with the shoe. You know, this isn't an advertisement, it's not sponsored by urine, this is an honest review of the shoe. In the same way, I really want to be honest with you guys about the fact that this is not a perfect product. I also wanna be very honest with you about the fact that I have to try to find, you know, a problem with these. If these shoes were $1,000, all the concerns I just talked about would be a bit more relevant. At $480, it's really nothing. I mean, these are the best value on the market for high-end leather footwear that I know of. These are really exceptional shoes, and it's really an incredible accomplishment to create such an incredible handmade shoe for under $500. So let's get these babies shined up and see how they look. But first, I wanna give a huge shout out to Jamie from Arterton, who entertained a 37 email thread with me of me sending him back and forth pictures and videos of my feet. Okay, sent this guy pictures of my feet, probably knows my feet better than anyone else, in order to make sure that I don't spend over $450 and wait several weeks just to get the wrong size of shoes. So this is really the service component of the review, because Jamie's the only person from Arterton I dealt with. And I have to say, I'm impressed. I'd never bought anything from Arterton before. I'd never spoken to someone from Arterton or Yearn. I emailed the main Arterton line out of the blue some time ago, and I asked them, hey, I have some questions. I'd like to do a sizing check. And I thought they were gonna respond with sort of like, okay, sure, whatever, like we'll help you out, fine. Let me show you the first email that they sent me. So I sent them my email, and then I get back, Dear Mr. Medeiros, Wow, many thanks for the very comprehensive email and video. It's much appreciated and it's rare for us to be provided so much information. We appreciate it because it makes our job easier. Now we're not gonna go through all the emails, but this is pretty reflective of the tone of all of them. I was shocked at how excited they were to help, right? They're not just saying, okay, yeah, we're happy. We'll, we'll help you out. It's like, thank you for making it easier for us to give you a better experience. And the shoes do fit, they're perfect. So it was like, totally, it was great. So not only was the whole experience with the customer service pragmatically helpful, I feel like with a lot of companies, you can almost feel bad asking them to help you. But I, I didn't feel that at all. I felt like they seemed so happy that I was even taking the time to try to make sure that I get the right product. But there's another detail that I wanna show you guys here. So let's take a look at this. So the first email he sends me, he addresses it. Dear Mr. Medeiros, okay? And then in another email, a few exchanges down, he says, good morning, Chris, if I may. Notice the timestamp on this. 
8.30 a.m. That's my time in Colorado. That's 3.30 p.m. in the United Kingdom. So this guy, not only, there's two things about this. Not only does he go out of his way to make sure he says good morning to me because he knows it's morning time where I am, even though it's not where he is. He also says, if I may. He says, Chris, if I may. He asks my permission to use my first name. You would never get that with an American company. <laughs> like, I've never had that experience. Usually it's like, hi, comma, or like, hey, Chris. Maybe it's like, hi, Mr. Medeiros, right? It's just a level of service that's unreasonably exceptional. And I know a lot of people would be like, Chris, why are you even highlighting? It's like weird that you're talking about this. It's like not a big deal. Like, who gig? It's not a big deal, right? But the thing is that it's not a big deal, that it doesn't matter, is exactly why it does. It's that they still go out of their way to do that. It tells me that they really care about providing an exceptional experience to their clients. You know, the work, the sacrifice that I make in my life, you know, to make the money that I make, that they value that. And I can't think of a quality that I greater appreciate in a company that I'm working with. So, you know, I, I know it's a long video, but I feel compelled to highlight this because these sort of qualities are what we need more of. We want more of this. And you know, the fact that I was talking to one specific person the whole time, it wasn't 10 different people. It wasn't just the Arterton team. It was Jamie from Arterton. I felt like I was talking to a person, you know, and it, I give this man a raise. I don't want a sponsorship. I want Jamie to get a raise. Now let's shine these shoes. Dang, it's so good.